Well, I've noticed that uh, a lot of uh, VC videos lately have become very whimsical and playful and um, showing or proposing all kind of new angles and trajectories of how to look at music and at your record collection. So I thought I'd try something in the same or similar direction. So um, when I was a basically little boy, like 13 years old, I grew up in a small uh, village in the upper Bavaria. And uh, I had a classmate, a buddy in the school, and we both listened to slightly advanced music compared with the other kids in the class. The other kids in the class kind of listened to what was just happening in the pop world and we had been already deeply into Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and uh, even uh, dipping our toes in the world of uh, Yes and uh, Genesis and Pink Floyd and stuff like that. Stuff you listen when you are 13, basically. <laughs> God, some people are probably wishing to kill me right now. I'm sorry. I deeply apologize. Calling uh, Led Zeppelin fans infantile. <laughs> mm. However, um, oftentimes we kind of play this game when we were walking home from school. I think it kind of came up as an idea because uh, there was this annual music festival in the village where kind of local bands came together, kind of playing in the gym, for example, of the school, and uh, like five to six bands. And um, we were a small boy, so we always had this fantasy, how great would it be if we were connected enough that we could kind of hire some of the really famous bands and then this band will, would come to our small village and play there and everybody would be just looking at us and thinking, hey, those are the guys that are buddies with Deep Purple, man. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> so that's how, how, we th how, we saw, how we saw ourselves when we were like 13 or 14. And, uh, but it usually, it, it usually completely escalated, so we kind of started to fantasize about this amazing festival with only bands we liked and uh, after 10 minutes these ideas turned turned out to be completely preposterous and nonsensical because no promoter no organizer in the world could have arranged this kind of a lineup of bands <laughs> But um, at the same time, those were the days of, uh, particularly in Germany, those were the days of these monster festivals. And actually, um, we were too young to go to such concerts, of course. Uh, but uh, we knew that there were all kind of two or three days long festivals presenting like 20, 30 bands and some of them really famous. So uh, it was not entirely outlandish, but uh, we kind of, for ourselves, we kind of invented a fantasy festival, as I would call it now. And um, that's what I wanted to do. Now, um, basically, this is just the idea. Um, if I would be um, kind of the king of the world or a god of this planet or whatever, and I would just set up my personal three-day festival of love, peace and happiness, what kind of bands would I invite and how would I set up the course of the evenings, plural, because it will be three days long, and uh, where would this uh, festival take place, and what bands would come, etc, etc. So in a sense, it's just a giant metaphor for me saying, look here, 30 albums that uh, I've been listening a lot lately, that are kind of my favorites right now, and um, it's all just kind of packaged in this idea of fantasy festival but it has rules so for example i can't i can't evoke uh, artists that are already dead regardless how tempting it might be and uh, also it's kind of important to um, at least those are the rules that i'm now applying to myself you don't need to do that in your own fantasy <laughs> festival those are not universal rules so um it's also interesting to kind of think about how um how a festival like that should on one hand reflect my personal wishes on the other hand it should be plausible 
And within, within this plausibility, you can kind of try to come up with interesting creative ideas that are probably a little too extreme, but that's why it's called fantasy festival and uh, not a reality festival. And um, so, um, first of all, what would the venue, where would the venue be? Where would it take place? That's kind of an interesting question. I mean, there are two ways to go about it. One way is it's kind of organized like a uh, Fairport Convention Festival. So we have basically a giant meadow with a stage and, and uh, a PA and um, all kind of uh, stands around the place so you can buy food and some place for kids or whatever. It's kind of the the folky, the folky variant of the whole thing. Or you can uh, go in a more intense direction, uh, certainly more tighter in organization and uh, rent an entire hall. And uh, of course the one place that came to my mind because I've seen some incredible concerts there is the Olympia Halle in Munich. Now the Olympia Halle in Munich is not particularly charming uh, from the inside. Um, um, so it's not the kind of place you would probably rent if you organize a three-day festival because uh, just the, the architecture is kind of slightly too brutal for that on the inside. On the other hand, it's a place that has proven to be very, very versatile and very flexible. So uh, you can do some experimental things there, I think. Um, most of all, it has this kind of a gallery outside of the of the arena and of the seats, so we, where you can place all kind of stands and all kind of commercial things, because it's gonna be a festival, so people are just walking in and out and it's all in a constant move. This is not the kind of venue where you work with uh, with seats and with chairs in the arena. It's gotta be more, more open, more flexible, uh, particularly because no one can just sit for nine hours. So, um, Olympia Halle, yeah, um, I mean, the, the one thing that came to mind is to create some kind of a rather exotic stage concept. Now, you can't, you can't because um, the one thing that's always been annoying in festivals is that the downtime between two bands occasionally turns out to be far too long. I mean, I've, I remember pauses of like one, one and a half hours before the next band come comes on stage and that's oftentimes for all kind of reasons. Um, and um, so it would be interesting to have a some sort of a double stage concept where um, one stage can be prepared while on the other stage uh, the ba another band is already playing. And that way um, you can probably um, get the pauses between the gigs maybe down to 15 minutes in theory and uh, I mean it's possible today I guess because a lot of the sound check setups in this time and age can be very well just stored digitally and um, once the particular band is on you can kind of restore a lot of settings and you save a lot of times so it's certainly much easier today than 30 years ago now, uh, what you can't do is just to have two stages like opposite to each other in the hall because then you would have need everything twice. You would need two PA sound systems and stuff like that. That's nonsensical. But what I thought is you could create a kind of a wedge situation uh, where you have uh, a slightly exotic uh, stage that uh, is basically a double stage created at a certain angle. And uh, that way, um, regardless if you are on left or right side, um, you still kind of project the music in the same direction all the time. Yeah, maybe I'm <laughs> maybe I'm overthinking this a little bit, but it's it's kind of it's an, it's an it's an interesting concept I think because uh, I've never seen I've never seen a stage design like that. I mean, it would it would be a rather flat angle, so um, it's not like uh, the band is projecting the music in one direction and then looking in a completely different I mean the the discrepancy would be only like 20 degree angle or something so I think this would be acoustically this would be this would be completely all right so that's the nerdy stuff um, 
so it, this would be like a, one of these prolonged weekends because Friday fa falls on a holiday. So you can set up three afternoons and three evenings. Um, I think the show should start 3 p.m. and will go like until, I don't know, one hour after midnight or something like that. Um, I think every band should play like 40 minutes, um, maybe 45 if uh, the situation demands it. And the headliner of each of the three evenings should have twice as much time, so like 90 minutes. And that way you can uh, cover it all in kind of nine hours per day. And uh, so let's start with the Friday. Now, by the way, don't worry, I will not spend 15 minutes talking about every single record. This is not going to be a five hours video. So the whole festival would be kicked off by a rather creative outfit um, that actually does not exist and that is entirely made up by me. But in a sense, sounds pretty plausible. It would be 40 minutes of um, Omar, Farouk, Tekbilek, Brankin, Kayan Kalhor and Erdal Erzincan. And uh, those four people never played together on stage or on a record, but uh, they are basically two tag teams that are threw together. Because Omar Farouk Tekbilek and Brian Keane has recorded, well, all kind of records together. Probably their famous and best one is the album Beyond the Sky which is uh, quite an incredible record and uh, yeah it's a wonderful example of uh, very uh, atmospheric uh, North African Arabic music. Um, Omar Farouk Tegbilek is a famous, um, he's a basically a kaval and a nai player so I think his main instruments are so these traditional Arabic flutes and um, yeah, I mean, Brian Keane is an incredible guitar player and uh, very famous also. And um, what he brings uh, to the table is this certain flamenco vibe, um, and uh, which immediately creates this feeling of, uh, of Maghrebinian and, and, and Spanish music places and times like the Caliphate of Cordoba. Um, is probably what comes to mind when listening to this music. Well, this album here is actually inspired by uh, the American writer Paul Bowles and um, his incredible book The Sheltering Sky, um, which uh, these artists, uh, well, kind of reflect in the music. And um, so this is a very, very, very atmospheric, um, occasionally slightly corny uh, sort of Sahara music, uh, but I quite like this record. Now this other duo is Erdal Erzincan and Kaihan Kalhor. Um, uh, this is uh, their album The Wind, released on ECM. Um, not long ago, this came out 2006. Now um, um, Kaihan Kalhor is playing a Kemenche, which is uh, this kind of a Persian, East Turkish uh, instrument that is a uh, little bit like a fiddle or a, or a violin um, but you play it upright uh, mostly sitting down and um, you play it with a bow and it has this very characteristic sound that you immediately associate with this region and this music I think it became very popular in the last years um, in, uh, in sort of a Hollywood movie soundtracks whenever it's needed to express some uh, kind of a oriental feeling and um, yeah and um, Erdal Erzincan is a Turkish uh, balama player so balama is basically like the sas it's a base this typical Turkish or Arabic uh, string instrument guitar like uh, with this characteristic sound what they are doing is they take usually one motive one musical idea and just start rolling with it so this entire album is just one big improvisation um, made of 12 themes or 12, uh, 12 sessions and um, it's wonderful. This is the kind of music where you get immediately lost in the sauce, so to speak. So uh, this is um, such an excellent tapestry of, of 
of Middle Eastern themes and, and improvised melodies and uh, pretty wonderful. Now, so the idea to kick off my festival was to um, put all four guys uh, on stage and let them improvise for 40 minutes. And uh, that's how the festival would start. Now, the next project on the same day would be um, the German band Das Hobos, which I think is kind of a good band for, um, for starting a festival. And uh, their music is still rather calm and slightly dreamy. Um, so um, I think it's always interesting to set up a festival evening in a way where there's a certain there's a certain uh, trajectory of drama happening and uh, so some bands are pretty good uh, for being at the beginning of a festival while others are usually ideal headliners. Now obviously in the real world uh, it's more it's more organized by fame and by by clout so um, obviously what comes later is the bigger band and um, I try actually to ignore this a little bit here and more think about what a perfect evening would be. Um, the next band, um, the a band from the Netherlands, the Mauskovich Dance Band. It's an incredible kind of funky outfit uh, that has created a sound of their own in a sense because uh, it's a very unique approach to the recording of music. It's all very funky and it's very groovy. They have a great bass player and uh, it's kind of an odd mixture of uh, 80s no wave music from New York and uh, Colombian percussion music uh, with uh, touch of Afrobeat in it and a lot of elements of disco actually and um, they create this kind of weird brew that always feels a bit lo-fi and they're using a lot of effect machines from from the older days so to speak and uh, it's very original I mean you, you would probably stylistically you would probably put it in the same corner as Kruang Bin um, but uh, it still sounds quite different than Kuang Bin. It's more edgier and more slightly more crazy and not as laid back, certainly. So, the next band in the late afternoon would be Kokoroko. This is their wonderful EP. That's quite a beautiful example of contemporary jazz with a strong touch of Afrobeat. Really love this record. I mean, this is a rather short EP, but uh, what a beautiful sound and what a great joy to listen to this. Particularly, there is Mutale Chashi uh, playing bass here, and uh, this is a uh, one of the great new bass players. I think, I think we will hear a lot from him in the next years. Still a very young guy, but incredible bassman, and uh, yeah. Uh, Certainly, this would be the moment when the Friday of this festival kind of picks up a certain dynamic and speed and uh, becomes a little more energetic. So, the next band is um, Leclerc. This is their al album Sauropoda. This is a band from Switzerland, Geneva, that is playing... Uh, yeah, it's sort of a um, mixture of funk, jazz, psychedelic music, but it's all kind of a, in a framework of uh, down-tempo and electro. So uh, it's, 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 it's this great example of a music that is uh, exactly on the fence of being an electronic album or being an entirely acoustic record and uh, wonderful keyboard sounds and uh, this beautiful layers and, and a great album if you are jogging. I've ran a lot to this record. And uh, let's move on. Uh, by now we are already in the evening time and uh, the next band would be 
Al Doom and the Farids, a band from North Italy. And um, this is kind of a psychedelic jazz rock outfit uh, uh, that incorporates ideas from Hinduism. And uh, quite an incredible band and very interesting and it would certainly be a project that I would love to see on my in my fantasy festival. Now only three outfits left until uh, the first evening is over. So from now on everything must be slightly hysterical. So let's start with Ikebe Shakedown. Um, this is what the evening needs right now, uh, some powerful uh, energetic Afrobeat sound uh, with a cinematic scope and with a funky surf rock guitar and a incredible brass three-piece in the middle of it all. So um, this is their album Kings Left Behind. Um, Definitely a great band to have in my fantasy festival. And the evening would continue with something that's really close to my heart. Um, this is an album by Gaye Suakyol. This is a Turkish singer, songwriter and producer and um, someone who has become in the course of the last years, probably my favorite female vocalist. She's an incredible singer, very recognizable, and um, she writes an amazing music, uh, oftentimes very whimsical and very playful, probably in the same spirit as I have probably perceived Kate Bush when I was young, when I was a teenager. It's a very different music, but, uh, but there's the same tendency to have a very individual handwriting in your songs and um, I really like that. And she's a very big star in, in the Turkey right now. She's from Istanbul and um, yeah, so that's why uh, she's almost headlining this evening. And finally, the headliner of this evening should be Steve Hillage. Yeah, I think it would be about time that Steve Hillage uh, made uh, some concerts that is not a techno performance with Miket. <laughs> so uh, he's still young enough to pull this off, um, to give a performance kind of in the spirit of his psychedelic uh, prog rock years of the late 70s, early and late 70s, and um, as beautifully represented with this wonderful album. And uh, he would be the headliner of the Friday. Steve Hillich.